All right, sorry, I'm always worried it's not gonna actually start, but let me just make sure we are streaming here and recording and all of that good stuff. All right, there we go. All right, now I can see it. All right, so uh, welcome to the third linguistics lecture. Today, we're gonna be talking about text-to-speech and speech-to-text technologies. Let me see here, go to the right PowerPoint. There we go. So just to review a little bit, in last week's linguistics lecture, we talked about phonetics, right? We started our phonetics unit. We learned about computational methods in articulatory phonetics and acoustic phonetics. So how those methods can be used both to kind of like better understand data that we need for those uh, subfields, but also to kind of simulate how children might learn to do those things, to create the acoustic data or the articulations needed for the speech in their language. Uh, and then we ended that lecture by talking about the competing theories about features that are used to describe sounds and how linguists have tested those theories using computational models of language learning. So uh, that was kind of the sort of proper computational phonetics, we'll call it. Uh, in this video, we're going to be talking about the sort of applied computational phonetics. So how do computer scientists and, and computational linguists engineer practical systems that are capable of creating and understanding the acoustic information in speech? And also as a little bit of review, I know I skipped over it there, uh, last week's Python lecture was about loops and if statements. So if you missed that and, and you are now realizing, oh, I don't know what those things are, make sure you go back and, and watch that. All right, so let's first talk about speech to text. So speech to text, also uh, often called speech recognition, is a kind of software that maps from audio data to text data. And it allows speech to be automatically transcribed, right? So uh, before this was around, you had to have people transcribing things if you wanted stuff written down, right? Uh, that's still a profession today, right? People still write transcriptions. Uh, there are stenographers who even do that like quickly, right? They'll, they'll transcribe things that are actively happening in like a courtroom or something like that. But software for this task didn't really come around until the mid 20th century. That's when the first speech recognition software was created and it actually could only recognize 10 words. So it was a program that could recognize the spoken words for the digits zero through nine. And it did that by measuring the digits formants. So not only could it only recognize those 10 words, 0, 1, 2, et cetera, it could only recognize them if one of the scientists who made the software was the one saying those words. Uh, so it was very cool when it first came out, I think. Uh, people were very impressed by the fact that you could talk to this computer, but it had a lot of limitations that we might not even think about nowadays. In the following decades from that, computational linguists and computer scientists continue to work on the problem, and they often had three goals in mind. And we'll kind of touch on this, uh, touch on these goals throughout the slides today. But they wanted speaker independence. So they wanted it to work no matter who is talking, uh, which is still definitely something that's a problem today in, in some cases, and definitely was a problem with that early software, right, where it only would work if the people who made it were talking. The other thing that they were worrying about was processing speed. So uh, if it takes too long for your computer to map from acoustic data to text data, then it's not going to actually catch everything that happens, right? You need to be able to keep up with the talking that is going on around it. And you also wanted accuracy, obviously. So you wanted it to become very accurate at hopefully a larger dictionary of words than just zero through nine. So speech recognition software kind of slowly, incrementally got better and better throughout the 60s and 70s, and then became good enough to be usable in the 80s and 90s. You saw some uh, programs with very limited vocabulary entering into kind of consumer products. Uh, wrong very there, sorry about that. Should be V-E-R-Y. But people were able to actually kind of interact with this software in a practical way. It was good enough to where 
they could actually use it to help their day-to-day -day lives. Then in the 2000s, you saw um, some uh, big improvements to the point where in 2011, Apple felt confident releasing their Siri software to the public. So on iPhones that were made from 2011 onward, they had this uh, speech to text just automatically installed there on the phone. Uh, I mean, part of it was also dependent on being connected to the internet and wasn't actually installed on the phone, but the phones had the ability to connect you to speech to text software. And this represented the first time that the average person could use speech recognition software on a regular basis, right? So it was beginning to creep its way into consumer products in the 80s and 90s. But in 2011, Siri was good enough to actually just kind of give to the average person and say, hey, do you want to know what the weather is? Just ask. Or do you want to set a timer on your phone? Just tell it to do that, right? This was a big leap forward and was something that was very impressive at the time. So let's talk about how that works. How does speech to text actually happen? Uh, so there are different approaches that have been taken throughout the decades. Uh, and some of these are still kind of competing, right? Some of these are still used today uh, or and sometimes are used kind of together in, in sort of hybrid approaches. So the first approach is a rule based approach. And what this is, is just a list of rules for what kind of audio maps to what kind of text. So like I was talking about before with the uh, original software that could recognize zero through nine, it had a list of rules that said, hey, the formants for zero in a sound wave should be here, here, and here. It should be at these frequencies. And so if, if they were there, it said that you said zero. If the formants were in the spot where that you said the formants for one would appear in, then it would print out one, right? Just a simple list of rules. The next method is what's called a hidden Markov model. And uh, we're not going to get into actually creating those in this class. That's something that the next kind of phase of computational linguistics in, at UMass covers. Uh, so what we want to just know about hidden Markov models is that they're a way of mathematically modeling any kind of system that develops over time and that you have uncertainty about. So in the case of speech to text, it's going to take the current audio and it's going to take like a chunk of it, right? So a few milliseconds of audio. And it's going to not just look at that, but it's also going to look at all of the previously produced text it's created. So if you give it someone saying hello world, it's going to take that sound wave and first look at the first bit and say, oh, this could be like an H or it could be, I don't know, maybe an S or something, right? It might not be that sure, but let's say it guesses H. And that, that'd be a correct guess for hello world, right? Then it goes forward a little bit in the sound wave and says, oh, okay, well, this, this next letter could be an E or an A. And maybe just based off of the sound wave, I think it might be an A. But based off of the fact that there's an H before me, that makes me think it's actually an E because, you know, maybe there are more H-E words than there are H-A words. Probably not, but just for the, the case of that example. And it'll step through the whole sound wave like that looking not only at the particular part of the sound wave it's trying to figure out a transcription for, but also at all the transcribing it's done up till then. The last method here is a neural network. I know we've talked about these before in this class. So this is a way of simplistically simulating neurons. That is, you know, your brain cells. So you're just kind of, instead of saying, oh, let's kind of figure out a particular algorithm or set of rules, to map from this acoustic data to some text, you're saying, let's just simulate some neurons and have them kind of learn that pattern over time. And um, we'll be talking about this a lot throughout this class, neural networks. We'll really be diving into how they work, though, in the morphology unit. So kind of bear with me. We're not going to get into the nitty gritty details of that just yet, but um, we will eventually get to those. <clears throat> So those are the three main approaches to actually building your speech to text software. Uh, sources for training data are also important, right? So how are you going to teach the models like neural networks that actually need to learn things uh, how to do that process in the first place? You need a whole lot of audio data and you need a whole lot of uh, written text that corresponds to that audio data, right? 
So some examples of popular data sets that people have used are audiobooks. So there's a very big data set of public domain audiobooks that have been used for this kind of task. And you just teach it to map from the audio of the audiobook to the text of the actual book. Other things uh, that have been used are broadcast news recordings and transcribed telephone conversations, things like that. The last thing to know about the methods people use for speech to text is that word error rate, often uh, shortened to WER, is the main way the success of speech to text is measured. So to know whether a particular model of speech to text is better than another model, you'll usually compare their word error rates. To calculate this, what you're gonna do is look at the text the model produced and the text it should have produced, figure out the smallest number of edits needed to transform the former to the latter, so the wrong thing to the right thing, and then that's gonna give you a certain list of substitutions, deletions, and insertions you need to make, right? Which words need to be switched out for other words, which words just need to be deleted, and which words need to be inserted that the model missed. So you add up how many you have of each of those and divide by the total number of words in the utterance. And that's going to give you your word error rate. So it's substitutions plus deletions plus insertions divided by the total number of words. And that's going to tell you roughly how close you were to getting the correct uh, text from some given speech. I've got an example here on the right of a particular speech-to-text uh, or uh, several speech-to-text models uh, kind of developed by a particular company over time. And you can see that as they got better and better at creating these models, the model's word error rate got lower and lower over time. So the different colored lines here are different kinds of data sets. So the blue line is from uh, conversational telephone speech, and the blue or and the orange line is from broadcast news transcriptions. And so the models started off in the mid 90s here with pretty high word error rates. The blue, the uh, conversational telephone speech was up at a, a word error rate of 80, uh, and the even the broadcast news was was over around like I guess 35, right? And then by the time you get to 2020 they've both gotten almost down to 5% word error rate. Not a great y-axis. Y-axis really should start at zero, but that's where they're at. So now let's talk about some problems with the way speech-to-text is done, uh, at least in our kind of modern context. So one of the major issues with modern speech-to-text technology is that it struggles to be inclusive of people who speak differently than the people the software is originally designed for. So uh, the reason for this is that oftentimes these methods uh, that are used to create the software are like neural networks, where they take data and they learn from that data how to map from audio to text. And so when building those data sets, if you aren't careful to include a wide variety of speakers, then you're going to end up with a neural net that just doesn't know how to understand dialects that weren't incorporated into its training data. So, for example, dialects that are seen as less prestigious are often ignored uh, or are often not included in data sets. And so uh, things like African-American English or Southern American English might not be included in that training data. And it means that applications that use those models are going to be less effective with those dialects. If someone is speaking Southern American English and tries to tell Siri to set a timer, Siri might not know what they're saying. Another... Uh, kind of group that's often left out of training data are speakers of languages with a relatively small number of people speaking them. And, and when I say small, I don't mean like 15 people, right? I mean like in the millions. So if your language has like 5 million speakers, there's a decent chance that there aren't a lot of good data sets computer scientists have made uh, to teach models how to do speech to text for your language. Uh, another example is languages spoken in communities without a large amount of money or resources, right? So both of those groups are often given less attention by folks who are engineering speech-to-text software. And so the software is going to work less well for them. 
Another concern that's been brought up with speech to text software is that a lot of applications require a keyword to turn on. So like saying Alexa to turn on your Amazon Echo. Sorry if I just turned on anyone's. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you don't have your speakers on near near one of those right now. Uh, or the other keyword I've got here in that slide, right? The one for Google phones. Uh, <clears throat> so one worry about that is that listening for that keyword could also allow the applications to listen to users when sensitive or private information is being discussed, right? That concern that like maybe your Amazon Echo is just always sort of spying on you. Um, and, and regardless of whether that's happened in the past, right? Uh, it, it's always a concern that, that some bad actor might use them for that purpose. Another related issue to that is the security of those applications. So it's been shown that it's possible to give commands to devices that rely on speech to text, like Amazon Echoes, that are either imperceptible to humans or sound like different commands to humans. So you can kind of figure out how to say, hey, set a timer for 15 minutes in a way that kind of hacks the uh, way that the speech to text software works and makes it do something nefarious, right? Like emailing personal information to, to someone or something like that. So that's awfully, that's obviously also bad. All right, now let's talk about text to speech. Dropped my pen down there. We'll leave it. All right, so let's do another little historical overview here because the history for uh, text to speech is actually uh, much bigger, or I guess uh, longer than uh, speech to text. It's a little bit of an easier uh, task. So producing artificial speech, uh, which is also often called speech synthesis, actually predates computers. So in the 18th century, a model of the vocal tract was built that could produce the vowels a, e, a, o, and u, as long as you were pushing wind through it. So it worked with a, billa, or a, a bellow, kind of like you would use to like get a fire hot, and you would use that bellow to make air go through as if, as if it was a vocal tract, and you can control some things to, to make these different vowel qualities. And that's a picture of, of this right here, or a drawing of that. It's right here, how that would work. And a simple voice production system that also didn't use any computers, uh, but could be controlled with a keyboard, was demonstrated at the 1939 World's Fair. So you could kind of play it almost like a piano, and uh, it was apparently very hard to do this, but you could then make it create understandable speech. In the 1960s, the first text-to-speech computer program was created. So uh, these other things didn't really do text-to-speech. They were just speech synthesis. But in the 1960s, we see actual uh, computer programs being able to take text data and convert it to audio data. And this technology developed pretty quickly. Like I said, it's a little bit of an easier task than going in the opposite direction, like we just talked about in those other slides. And uh, it even found its way into children's toys by the late 70s, right? Uh, I think it was 78 or 79, there was a kid's toy where you could type out a word and it would say it out loud. And modern speech to text technology sounds almost identical to human speech. Uh, so if, if you haven't experienced this before, I would encourage you to kind of go Google around and find some examples. It's, it's really surprising how real it sounds. Uh, and it's even been incorporated into TV shows. So. Uh, I think it was just last year. Yeah, uh, uh, last year to me right now, which is, oh, no, no. I guess that's two years ago. Sorry, it's it's February, so I'm still getting used to what year it is. But two years ago, uh, Disney aired a TV show that used s purely synthesized speech for one of its characters. And uh, it wasn't, like, as good as an actor, but it still sounded like a person was talking. So... That kind of goes to show just how much that has developed in just the last century. So now let's talk about methods for uh, speech synthesis. So a lot of different methods exist for creating artificial speech. The first one is concatenation. And this involves recording a human saying many different sounds or sequences of sounds, and then pasting those together to create the words that are required by the synthesis application. So you just put a person in a recording booth, you have them say a bunch of different things, and then you cut up the things they said and have the computer program say, oh, I need a B, and I need an A, and I need a T to say bat. So let me just go get those three files and play them right in a row. 
So an advantage of this is that it avoids the complicated issue of creating sound waves, right? The sound waves are already made for you by a real life human. You're just kind of sticking them together, but it can often sound really unnatural since the sounds were recorded apart from one another. Uh, so in more advanced versions of this, you will have the person record whole words and sometimes even whole sentences for popular phrases. Uh, but you're still going to end up probably needing to say not so popular phrases sometimes and not so popular words sometimes. And so uh, those are going to end up sounding pretty kind of stilted and mechanic. The next method is rule based formant synthesis. And this uses pre specified rules for what the formant should look like for various speech sounds and creates sound waves based on those rules. So this is kind of the opposite direction, but the same principle as the rule based, uh, let's see, uh, speech to text we were just talking about a few slides ago. So you just say, hey, formants should go here for this sound, there for that sound, and create the data that way, just purely based off of the rules. And this can work effectively in some contexts, uh, but it's often difficult because the way a sound is pronounced is really context dependent, and that can make rule writing just impractical, right? You have to write rules that are going to deal with every different kind of way a sound can be used, and that ends up just being too many rules to, to realistically have around. And the last two methods here, hidden Markov models and neural networks, are also really popular, with neural networks being the kind of most recent best way of doing this. And these both work, again, in a way that's really similar to how they function in speech to text applications. So no need to go into that into a lot of detail again. Like I said, hidden Markov models are kind of like the next computational linguistics class. You'll learn lots about those there. And neural networks we'll talk more about a little later in this class. So now let's talk about some of the problems with this particular kind of uh, practical use of phonetics. So one is that it can be difficult to know how to measure the success of a text-to-speech model. So obviously it needs to be understood by humans, right? That's the first measure of success you need. But it's also ideal if it sounds human-like, right? So I was talking before about how that concatenation method sounds really mechanical and not realistic usually, and that can be distracting, right? If you're, if you're trying to use these to create messages that people need to understand, you don't want to distract people from the message that needs to be set. And another issue is that human likeness is difficult to measure in an objective way. So text-to-speech lacks a widely accepted quantitative measure of success. So you can't do word error rate for this uh, because in order to get the actual uh, words in an output of a text-to-speech model, you would have to do speech-to-text, right? And that comes with its own word error rates. So you would just be kind of getting a really inaccurate measure of how good something was. So really a tricky thing to, to measure the success objectively for one of these things. And then the last concern here is similar to those like security concerns uh, with speech to text is that text to speech can be used to help create what are called deep fakes. So these are like videos or sometimes just audio files uh, that sort of mimic an individual's voice and can be used to create things that make it seem like a person is saying something they wouldn't normally endorse or do, right? So that's obviously an unethical thing to do in many cases, and <clears throat> uh, this technology helps sort of contribute to that. So that's something to worry about, right? How can we make sure that we can create good text to speech, but uh, maybe detect it if we need to so that we can tell whether something has been fake? Now let's talk about some other domains uh, that sort of the practical applications of phonetics have been used in, in in a kind of computational way. So the first thing to talk about is signed language. So we talked about last week how there's not a ton of work looking at sign language from a computational perspective, uh, but there has been a decent amount of work trying to do speech to text for signed languages. So this has been a goal for computational linguists and computer scientists for a while. One idea that's been really popular among researchers uh, is to have a signed language speaker where, oh, wrong where there, I'm having terrible spelling in these slides, sorry about that, but have them wear a special glove that translates the movements of their hand into written speech, right? So the glove itself has all sorts of sensors on it 
to say what each particular finger is doing and, and how it's being used. And, and then you translate that into speech. But that approach is kind of problematic for various reasons. One is that it ignores the fact that sign languages almost always use more than just a speaker's hands to communicate. So oftentimes, especially the face, is really, really relevant to what's being said in a signed language. Uh, there's also research that's been done on translating a full video of a person signing into written text. Uh, this is a more complex problem because it involves tracking visual information across time, which is a little harder than just tracking the sort of like uh, already uh, formatted data for you from a special glove. But it at least was actually taking into consideration all of the data that's relevant, right? So it, it's at least better in that sense. Um, but it's unclear whether these solutions would be helpful at all. So oftentimes any kind of research like this is being done with little feedback from the actual communities who use sign languages. And so uh, oftentimes they kind of center people who are using spoken languages, right? They're more about making it easier for people who are speaking English to understand people who are speaking ASL rather than making the lives of people who speak ASL better. Uh, and so that in general is just kind of a problematic thing about this approach generally, at least uh, on average. I'm, I'm sure there might be researchers out there who are doing it in a way that does take into consideration that feedback, right? That might be the case, but uh, the, the average person doing this uh, has not kind of acted in that way. The next thing to talk about uh, that involves phonetic data being used in a sort of practical way is emotion recognition. So this is sometimes done with video and audio, but audio-based emotion recognition does exist. And so typically these models output is a probability distribution over some pre-specified set of possible emotions. So like happy, sad, mad, etc. So you're going from a sound wave to an emotion that you think that sound wave is expressing. Not really worrying about the fine-grained linguistic details, just trying to say, hey, is this person happy or mad or, or whatever. One reason why this field is less advanced than like speech to text and text to speech is, is that it's harder to get data that represents a natural audio to emotion mapping. Uh, so some data sets do exist for this, but what they are, are they're often clips of actors who read a line after being told to pretend they felt a certain way. So you know, they're, they're, the people making the data sets will say like, hey, say these words mad, now say these words sad, now say these words happy. And the actors do that in front of a camera with a microphone. Uh, but that's obviously not like real data, right? That's just mapping from acoustics to what an actor thinks those acoustics ought to be expressing. So it's a little hard to get models trained on that data to then generalize to real life. And creating data sets of actual natural emotions is a lot more difficult than the other kinds of data sets we've talked about in these slides. Uh, and probably it's pretty unethical, right? If you need to get a negative emotion from someone, it might not be great to be recording someone when they're sincerely sad or mad or something like that, right? And the last thing we're gonna talk about in these slides today is speaker recognition. So this is software that can recognize a specific person's speech given audio of their voice. So you're not trying to check what they're saying necessarily, just who is doing the saying. So there are a variety of acoustic factors that can help with this that are specific to an individual's way of talking. So for example, if you look at the specific frequency of a person's performance, you can determine the length of their vocal tract with pretty good accuracy. Um, as well as the thing that you normally use formants for, which is the quality of the vowels, right? So that's just one piece of information that's gonna vary from person to person because people are generally gonna have slightly different lengths for their vocal tracks. Early speech to text software accidentally implemented speaker recognition, right? So we were talking before about how uh, that application that could recognize the digits zero through nine could only do it if the people who made it were actually the ones talking. So that was kind of speaker recognition, right? It would recognize specifically their voices, uh, but that was sort of accidental, right? Back then, they wanted to overcome that limitation. If you're doing speaker recognition software now, you're trying to really hone in at uh, recognizing a particular person. 
There are two types of speaker recognition software. So there's verification software and identification software. So verification involves testing whether audio comes from a specific person. So we know that this person is supposed to be uh, unlocking their phone with their voice maybe. So just check for that person's voice and see if the audio you're getting is from them. Identification takes audio and then has a list of people that audio could belong to. So it's saying, hey, given this audio, do you think it's Taylor or Alex or Sam who was talking? Something like that. Often speaker recognition is used as a security measure. So you'll have someone say a password and the computer's gonna check both the accuracy of the password using speech to text and then regular password stuff. And then it's also gonna check the identity of the person and say, hey, is this the person who ought to know what the password is? So those are kind of just three more ways in which you take phonetic data and use it for some kind of practical use. All right, those are the end of the slides for this linguistics lecture. So next week, we'll be starting our unit on phonology. Um, this week, in terms of assignments, you'll have your first project in the class. Uh, so you're, it's all going to be all about formants. You'll be learning how to use the software Prot to measure what formants are. And then we'll use Python to actually plot those formants on a graph so that you can see what the formants for your vowels are. Uh, making kind of a plot like we looked at in the last linguistics lecture of those Russian vowels. Um, so let me know if you've got any trouble with that. Otherwise, I will see you in either the Python lecture video for this week or the linguistics lecture for next week. Bye.